Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you this morning. We definitely miss John and wish him well and, and many others. We miss you. We just wish that we could be together as a church body, uh, meeting and loving and praying and, and just sharing our hearts with one another, our passions, our desires, and our dreams. It is so difficult to do that now during this COVID season. And so we are looking for the time in which we can get together here shortly, be in prayer as we're moving forward with the permits in our church building. Uh, we hoped or praying that we can meet together again very, very soon. So pray with us as we work through this difficult time together. This morning, we even had a few people drive up who we, you know, just, I just heard again, are not well connected. Uh, they're not online and things like that. So just pass the word to each other. Get on a website or help people to get on our website to get signed up for the newsletter so you can stay informed. If you have any questions, feel free to email us, to text us, to call us. We'd love to share with you what's going on, and we'd love to hear from you too as well. So again, I wanted to share this with you. We miss you. We love you. It is so difficult to do ministry through the camera. I'm just going to share that with you. It's a new set of skills that we've never had to deal with and never learned before. So uh, it's definitely been difficult. And I just want to share our worship team and our tech people have done an outstanding job as, as we have grown together in this uh, area of ministry too. So I want to say kudos to them and kudos uh, to you that have just hung in there with us. I want to encourage you to stay, stay tuned in with us as much as you can and we'll do our best to communicate with you too as well. We're in a series of with, and it's sort of funny that we're talking about something, uh, relationships. And man, isn't that a change? Isn't it sort of revolutionary in the way that we do relationships now uh, as a church body, as a people, with our neighbors, with our friends, even when we go shopping in the town, even, even our kids as they go to school. Relationships seem to be like, it is really difficult to do life with. And uh, so we've taken time in this last series is to talk about relationships. How do we do relationships with God and others? And John has spoken the last few weeks about a couple things, how to do relationships with difficult people, how to do relationship with outsiders. And today we're going to talk about how do we do relationships with insiders, church people, with each other. You know, <clears throat> in Scripture we have a lot that uh, God has shared with us on just how we're supposed to act and love one another. And it is amazing how we all really struggle with authentic, genuine relationships in our faith walk. Not only with God, but even with each other, with our families, with our children, uh, with people in the church. We're all different people. You know, one of the most divided times in America, we know, is right here Sunday morning in our churches. There's black churches, there's white churches, there's Indian churches, there's Chinese churches, there's, there's Lutheran, there's Catholic, there's Methodist, there's brethren, there's independent churches, there's non-denominational churches. There's really a non-denominational church is only a Baptist church with a cool coffee bar. But anyway, so I just want to share that with you. So we are really divided. And the way we even do worship, we have worship with hymns. We have, we have hard rocking worship and stuff. And then even in the churches we worship together, churches sort of have a culture within itself and how they do worship. I think it's interesting. How many people have been to a hand-raising church? I know I have. In fact, I attended one for many years out in Hawaii. It was a hand-raising church. Now, Randy would love it if we as a church could learn to raise our hands and be interactive with our worship. But, you know, it's just really not who we are. So what I wanted to do is spend some time here this morning to talk about that. Just There's different levels of worship are different levels of hand raising and we have different names for those hand raising so i'm just going to take a time here to to share with you what they are and i know randy will really appreciate this and so you know as we start out here you know um 
Um, you just sort you just put your hands in your pocket. You just, as the mu- music starts to play and, and to rock a little bit, you can, you know, have your hands in your pocket. You can, you know, make your arms move a little bit and, and rock back and forth with it. You know, this is maybe the first baby step that you take when it comes to hand raising. And, and oh, oh, the next thing you want to do is carry the TV. So our hands are out like this. We're carrying the TV. Uh, oh, oh, we have we have a uh, wall mount TV here. So have a wall mount TV here. And oh, and the next thing that we can go to is, you know, uh, how big is the fish? How big is the fish here? And uh, oh, oh, and then we get out here a little bit. The next thing we're going to do is, you know, we're twisting the light bulbs just a little bit. We're moving them back and forth and righty tighty, lefty Jesus. We're, we're doing that with the light bulbs a little bit. And and uh, and then we then we sort of move on to the big thing, the goalposts. So we got our hands up with the goalposts, and we got them up here like that. And and then maybe a little bit later, oh 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 yeah, I got a little heartburn. So we uh, tap on the heart here a little bit. Oh, we change arms. We got the other arm, and we're waving that a little bit too. And you know we're just oh, and, and then you know we we get to the next big step. The I call it the big three. They're sort of. Uh, one in the same, but uh, here's what it is. is uh, It's pointer, sc- hatchet, schoolhouse. Again, pointer, hatchet, schoolhouse. And we sort of pump our hands back and forth. We give Jesus a high five. And, and maybe if you're a lady, you love to clean windows. And you start to sway back and forth. Uh, you're cleaning a window. And your arm's moving back and forth, just back and forth there. We get it. And, and, and then, hey, you know, once you get to that and you really get comfortable... You know, the big three. You know, we have the big three that are, that are, that is next. So what we have is a, a village people, Rocky, touchdown. Village people, Rocky, touchdown. And what do you do when you get to this point? You know, you, you sort of bounce up and down and, and with it. So now, now, now you got, uh, got something going really good. Now, you don't want to get out here because you get out here, you get in other people's space. You got to stay in your lane. So you want to stay up here. So uh, just a little lesson this morning and what it means that as a church, if we want to be a hand-raising church, that's sort of the protocol we want to follow as we begin to take our steps and, and grow in the idea of being a hand-raising church as we do worship. I know Randy would really appreciate that, that you get interactive in the service too as well. But anyway, just sort of to share, again, to our point, there's just a lot of different ways. There's these unwritten rules that we have as church. So when people start coming to our church, really they don't know these rules. They don't, don't understand uh, the culture of going to church, what's accepted and what's not accepted and within the church. And so, you know, it's sometimes difficult for people as they start out in that walk with Jesus and, and how does that work? And, and then just want to share, sometimes we know as church people, we can be pretty judgmental. And they might not measure up to what we think and what we want and and we don't know what to say. And I can remember when we started a pastor in the inner city and really started to invite a lot of the teenagers from the inner city. They have never been to a church in their life. They didn't even really understand who God is or what God was. And they started coming to church. And I can remember they were sitting in the church service and you're supposed to whisper if you're talking to your friend. But instead, you're talking out loud while the pastor's preaching and everybody would look. And then we said to the kids, just don't sit together. Just spread yourself out amongst the people in the church. They'll, they'll love sitting with you. <laughs> so as they sat out amongst the people in the church, people would get up and move <laughs> and sit someplace else because they didn't want to sit next to that teenager. Because they just didn't understand. And I can remember talking to a few of the adults and they would say, no, you know what? It's just, I'm here to get something out of it. You know, they're just disturbing. You know, they're just wrecking the service for us. And, you know, it's just not working for us. And that really spoke to my heart. And, And here we're in a Corinthian church too as well that's got a lot, a lot of issues. And they have a lot of relationship issues. And in fact, Paul, if I just sort of set the context of this book this, of Corinthians that Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians, uh, he actually wrote a letter earlier. It's referred to in Corinthians, but apparently the people of the church just didn't understand it. So he took time to write the second letter to this uh, group of people in Corinth. In fact, this town was probably the 
epicenter of trade in the Roman Empire, sort of like New York is and Los Angeles. I mean, this was the town to be if you were doing business. Every, all roads traveled through Rome and from Rome through the town of Corinth. There was a real middle class in Corinth. There was still poor people, but there's a lot of middle class there. There was a lot of wealthy people there. There were people from all over the world that came there just to do trade from all different countries. There's just a lot of different cultural things going on in that community. And, and of course, that's in the church, different religions. And they had issues with religion. They worship idols. They, they uh, worshiped uh, uh, gods that were false gods, uh, Greek gods. And, and Athena was actually the, the town's main god there. And, and also it was a town that really liked to discuss life. They had a huge theater that sat 15,000 people just to come as a place or a center in which they could gather together and just talk about all the important things or the things that were happening or the ideas of life and religion and, and all those different things that went on there. Plus, they had another center where they had an amphitheater for that put on theater. It was just a cultural center, a place where you just wanted to be. It was sort of the center of the world at that time, just like New York is sort of the center of the world today. And so this was the town, and they had a church there that Paul had begun. And they had struggled with all these different diverse people of, of uh, you know, ethnic backgrounds, diversity of wealth and, and money and, and thinking and prosperity, you know, just a lot of different things all blended in this church. And so they just had a lot of problems. One of the other problems they started with, they just had divisions among themselves and who they thought the church should follow. Some followed Apollos, some wanted to follow Paul. You know, they were all one and the same. They taught the same things, but apparently there was division over this in the church, as well as people taking people to court and suing one another, as well as there was a relationships within the family that were wrong with sexual immorality and, and all those different things that went on within the church. And when they even did communion together, they'd have a meal. And the people who didn't have food sat and watched while everybody ate that had food. It was sort of not a nice place to be. It didn't seem to be a church that I'd really want to go to. <laughs> and so Paul had to sit down and address this issue on how do we do church with each other. See, the destructive way in which the Corinthian people acted toward one another relationally was wounding and it was destructive. It hurt people. It wounded people for life. And so this was the issue that Paul was writing the book of Corinthians to the Corinthians. Now I can remember as I grew up in church, there's a couple of things that really hurt me <laughs> as I grew up. And uh, I was one of the kids that you would call the unlovelies. <laughs> and I've shared this with you before. Not well uh, behaved, uh, was poor, and sort of on the outside. I always felt never like I was on the inside. I always felt I was on the outside. And I can remember the day I got saved and what that meant in my life. And then as I grew in the Lord during that time, I decided that it was time for me to get baptized. So, oh, you know, and they said, sure, you have to sign up for this course for 13 weeks, 13 weeks. So I had to learn 13 weeks about what baptism was and what it meant to the believer. And then after I was done with that, I had to give my testimony to the deacons and then my testimony again to the church when I was baptized and also share a verse of, well, that was one of my favorite verses in order to be baptized. Well, I got done with the 13 weeks and I uh, was meeting with the deacons. <laughs> and the deacons just said, sorry, Bill. We don't really see Christ in your life. I thought, wow. You just don't quite measure up. I thought, wow. Next summer you can come back again and sign up and go through the course again and then we'll talk. That was devastating. I, I didn't understand what it meant to, to, to live for God. I was a young child, and uh, I was in a difficult situation and had difficulty behaving because I was just that kid. Couldn't sit snurt. I thought the people didn't love me. And then as I looked at families, I was never really included in the church. <laughs> 
families would take other kids out and do different things with, and I was always sort of the one that was... Those things hurt, and they affected me. They wounded me. They actually wounded my soul. And these are some of the things that are actually going on in Christ at the expense of other people. And we're just going to talk about that. They didn't understand how genuine relationships work in the context of God and love. We're going to take time here and we're going to read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And we'll sort of start with that. And it says this. Now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. Yes, we know that. We all have knowledge. We all have understanding about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, I'm going to stop there. And what Paul is really addressing here in those two statements, we all have knowledge and knowledge makes us feel important, is, is not about what we really know, but how what we know makes us all have knowledge in quotes. You all know that you're supposed to love one another. You all know that it's important that we treat each other with respect and kindness and, and we lift a hand out to those who may be in life like you are. Because I don't even think it's maturity is what we're talking about here. We're talking about just being able to do life in a responsible fashion. And because we got together, we with you. I can remember in a church one time <laughs> I was ministering at, we used to have a test called divorce and how there was abuse and everything like that. And, and it wasn't bad that they, weren't sh sh they, were, they were sharing some intimate things that wasn't meant to be shared in public. But on top of it, they ended it with this. I am so glad I'm not like them. <laughs> I'm so glad I don't have their problems. That was sort of code for that. And it's sort of amazing how... We in church, and yeah, we were there too. And we had to grow too. And so sometimes in a church, and this is what's going on here in this church, is that the church of have and have nots. A church of people who have it together or don't have it together. It had a hierarchy in it. You know, you're in the in or in the out. And a lot of times we do this not thinking about it. We not even do it on purpose. But he goes on to say the next part of the verse, he says this. And this is what he really says is the important or the crux of it. He says, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. So what he's really saying there, you just don't know what's going on in their lives. How could you? You don't know the circumstances. You don't know why they're going through this part in their life, the pain and what they got to overcome and the obstacles that are in a way and the way they got to do life is because you're in too important to have a real relationship with them, to know. So until you really get to know, you can judge them and can feel really good about yourself. And that's what was going on here. And he goes on to say, <clears throat> a little bit later in verse 2, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know them very much, but the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. Again, so makes it really clear here. It says this, is, it's not what you say, it's what you do. It's how you act with God's love that's important. How do you display it? How do you share it? And God says, I recognize you when you act in the same manner that I would act toward them. And God says, now I know you're one of my followers because I recognize it because you love God's people the same way that God loves people. You see people the same way that God sees people. You're willing to do whatever's necessary for them because you see them just the way God does and loves them the same way. It doesn't matter. So then he goes on to explain it further. He says this in verse 4. He says, so what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really God and that there's only one God. So what he really says there, it really doesn't matter. Why does it matter? Why should you care? 
in the scheme of things, it's, it doesn't matter. Because really, it, God, there's only one God. There's not two. And it goes on to say, he says this, there may be so-called gods both in heaven and in earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But he says this in verse 6, but for us, there's one God. So I want to take a time to just to talk about what it means to use God's love to strengthen the church. What does that mean? That means to build up, not to tear down. So God's love builds up. It doesn't tear down. So our actions should reflect that of God so he can recognize this, a love that is building people up and is not tearing them down. He goes on to say, <clears throat> and there is one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things were created and through all things we live. So there's nothing else that matters except our relationship with God and the love of God in how we handle our relationships with each other. So for some of us, and again, we get back to the culture of the Corinthians, they worshiped idols. And so when they came to know Christ, they were trying to make a definite change in their lives and not to have anything to do with an idol because they know it was evil <laughs> that they had worshiped this idol. But there were Christians there that had never worshiped idols before. And you know what? To them, an idol is a, a rock. You can carve a picture out of it or uh, a statue of Athena or worship a piece of corn or whatever, but you know what? That's not God. That's not who God is. So these young Christians were struggling with that in their lives. And so they didn't eat the meat. <laughs> offered to idols because they thought it was part of their worship, and it was. In fact, this meat was commonly sold all over the town of Corinth. And so they were doing their best to abstain from even the appearance of doing evil and trying to, to work on that problem that they had before and, and give their heart totally to God and that there would be no question about it in their lives. But there were some there who said, oh, I can eat meat. It means nothing. We had a man in our church, his name was Mr. Bolson, and he wouldn't mind me sharing this story with you. He was an alcoholic in a church that I grew up in. And he came out of alcoholism. He had a severe, he destroyed his family pretty much, though, just about because of alcoholism and his life, and God saved him from that. And I can remember at one of our church meetings, he stood up and he said this. He says, you know what? I don't think we should have barks pop cans at our church stuff. It was sort of funny. I can remember as a teenager sitting there going, what? It's just pop. But this is what he thought. He said, I don't want people to think that I'm still drinking. I don't want them to mistake that can for beer. Because I've had such a problem with it and I've hurt so many people because of it in this town and in this place. I just don't want people to think that we're drinking. Now, I get it. It's really not a big deal in the scheme of things, right? Well, same here. <laughs> it's the same thing here. In the scheme of things, eating this meat is, it's meat. But this is what he goes on to say here. <clears throat> And I just want to put this in the context of love. And, and, you know, and that's what Paul does. This is an example on how we should live our lives. It's, it's not meant that we should use it as legalism and we need to stop doing everything and we got to be careful that we don't offend everybody in the world. But I think he, he says it really clearly here uh, when he says this. He says in verse 7, However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real, so they eat food that has been offered to idols. They think of it as worship of real gods 
and their weak consciences. Okay, so we want to talk about what it means when we say weak consciousness. It sort of means this when we say weak, unstable in their faith. They haven't got their footing yet. They're easily hurt or easily offended. They're easily led astray. They sort of hesitate and vacillate in their life. And so they're struggling with some things in their life, finding it. And again, this is just one example, and it's probably not the biggest deal, and that's why probably use, Paul uses it, and that's why I use the beer can. It's not a big deal just to share, but the principle is a big deal. And that's what he's saying here. He says in verse 9, and, and I, I don't think I have it up here, but if you have verse 9, it says this, but you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. That you don't beat them up, that you don't pummel them, that you don't wound them, is what he's saying. It is to treat people with love. And not to abuse your own freedom at the expense of hurting someone else, but to be careful. Now, this is a common thing. I want to share this with you. We do it in all relationships. Think about it with our children. How careful are we not to hurt them? And what we say, what we watch, what we do, we're really careful. Why should it be any different with each other? That's what Paul is saying here is for us to be careful in our relationships with each other that they see love. And so he goes on to say this in uh, actually one of my favorite verses in um, Corinthians chapter 9. He says this, verse 19, he says this. And this is sort of what he sort of sums up what he's talking about in in, uh, chapter 8. He says this, he says, Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. To bring many to Christ. See, that's what the love of God compelled Paul to do, to be willing to sacrifice whatever it might have been so that he can bring people closer to God and closer to Christ as we do church together. That's the objective of one another is to love one another in such a way that we don't separate people from God, but we live our way with carefulness that we bring people closer to God and how that we treat them relationally, that they see the love of God and not judgment, not condemnation, not status, you're in, you're out, not any of those things is what he says. So, you know, again, Paul sort of, this whole book, sort of in chapter 13, says it all. It's that Paul sort of uses this as his main point of thinking is chapter 13 when he, when he talks about how do we treat a weaker brother? How do we treat people that owe us money? How do we treat people that when we're in conflict with one another? How do we treat people that are living in sin? And how do we treat people uh, as equals? He culminates it with this in chapter 13. He says this in verse 1. He said, if I could speak all languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would be only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. But I didn't love others. Our Christianity would be empty. It goes on to say this. He says a little bit further, he goes on, to say in verse 2, if I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood of all God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and if I had the faith that I could move mountains and didn't love others, again, I would be nothing. And then he goes on to say this in the next verse, if I gave everything I had to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. So what Paul says 
And our relationships that are central to doing church with each other is central about love. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, what you know, what you do, is that you love others the way Christ loves them. That is what this is all about. That's what our relationships mean the most, is that when people see that we really love them. And in this same church, I can remember, I really thought I was cursed and unloved by these people. I didn't get it that they loved me. I felt they weren't careful with me. They, they, they needed to be more careful about how they treated me. But they didn't. But they did at one time demonstrate that they really loved me. I can remember that the day I got right with God in ninth grade and I walked down the aisle and I looked back and the church was empty because they were around me praying for me. Then I knew they loved me. What a shame <laughs> that I didn't know before that. I felt judged. I felt not part. I felt criticized. I felt like I was not in the inn. Now I want to share with you, Trailhead Church is not like this. I know the people. <laughs> and I know the heart of our pastor and the leadership. And I know each one of you too as well. So why, Bill, are you sharing this with us? We need to be careful. That's why I'm sharing with you. And for two reasons, I'm going to share this with you. Again, when we wound people and hurt people's souls, it's devastating. They carry it for the rest of their lives. So I want to share these two thoughts with you. And when it comes to it, main thought, when we come to thinking about how we do relationships and what Paul is really saying here. So if you could flip to the next one, that'd be great. So it says this. <clears throat> so um, could you flip to the next for me, please? Thank you. Slide. Thank you. Those who love Christ give up on seeking their own status and satisfaction first and foremost. So you just give up and give in. You let go. And that's what Paul says. Even though I am free, I make myself a slave to others that I might win the more. I give up my rights, my freedoms, my response you know, to that, that I have, and I have every right to do it to help others know that God loves them and I love them to grow them closer to God. I just, I, I seek what they need foremost before what I need. And then secondly, it says this, is that I generally commit themselves to actively wait and actively seek the good of others. And so that's what Paul is saying here. He says it's not something that happens by accident. It's something that happens when you intentionally, uh, carefully, daily seek to do this with your children, with your family, with your church, with people at work, everywhere. It's really easy just to get sloppy and not be careful in our daily lives. And you might say, Bill, well, how do I do this? And so how do I act this out? And so I, I just say first thing you need, we need to do is learn how to um, just love people for who they are. Accept them for who they are. It doesn't matter. Men say, well, I say, Bill, what can I do to act that out? And Chromia, a pastor in a church, a youth pastor said this to, uh, I was at a youth conference, he said this, he said, seek out the most unloveliest person and love them that you know. The person that you think is basically lost. There was a deacon who said this in a meeting, and uh, forgive the terse word, but he used to say this. It used to really bother me. He said this. He said, sucks to be them when they had problems. That was a deacon. That was a person in the church. I know that person, and I know he didn't mean it the way it sounded. But that's why we need to be careful. So let's be careful. Let's find ways to love one another and our relationships. And so 
And uh, one of the things I admit during this COVID time has been really easy for me to hide away. <laughs> Real easy for me to make excuses. Not to find ways to love other people. Let me ask you, could you this week find one person that you know has a need and meet that need? Actively seek them out and actively love them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, again, we're so grateful for this time. We ask that you bless it. Lord, we love you and praise you. And we give you all glory in what you're doing here, the amazing things with our our children's uh, center and what's going on with the church. And Lord, it's so hard to be patient. Help us to be patient as we work through all these things. We ask that you bless us today at home and with each other, with our families, that you give us safety throughout the week. Uh, Lord, we pray for those who can't make it and those who are sick. And and Lord, uh, we think of John and Patrick, and I know there's others that are struggling. And Lord, we just ask that you be with them now encourage them in their walk. In Jesus' name, amen.